Um, you ever hear anybody say the grass is greener? Everybody kind of knows what that means, doesn't it? Uh, is it? I mean, usually, is it? Usually not. You know, if we, if we could, uh, like, pair up and swap problems, would anybody be willing to do that? <laughs> to take, trade your problems for, just pick somebody up. You'd probably want to keep yours. But we think ours are, the grass is always, it looks so much better if I had this and if I had that. And you see uh, pictures, uh, I, don't, I don't know, uh, Sarah, maybe you've drawn a picture like this where a, a horse is sticking his head through the fence eating on the other side. Uh, it, uh, grass looks greener, you know. Uh, but you know what? Uh, the grass is greener where we're going. Uh, there's not even any question about it. Uh, I like this world. I like, <clears throat> I like living in this world. I don't have any complaints. I, I, I only have uh, thankfulness. I, I can say that from my heart. I don't have any complaints. But you know, um, I, I, this the thought was coming to me all last week. We say the grass is greener and we use that term. Uh, but when you're talking about heaven, grass is greener. It is better. It's not, it doesn't just look better, it is better. And do you know how quick you can get to heaven? I mean, do you know how long it takes to get there? Bang. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Uh, and you don't have any control over it. You say, well, I think I'm going to just take a few minutes after I die. And, no, you're there. You're, you're absent from the body. You're in eternity. And uh, one thing about eternity is uh, no, no coming back. No second chances, no, well, let me think about this. Uh, you're there. I saw a book the other day, I, didn't, I haven't read it, but I saw the title of it, it said, Heaven is Real, So is Hell. Uh, that's right, we leave this body someday, sometime, and you're in eternity. You're locked. It's a done deal. And uh, you've, read, you've, you've read and heard about the near-death experiences, probably everybody knows somebody that knows somebody that uh, was out of the body and uh, could see, you know, could see back and they could see a light and they, they felt peace and, uh, you know, they're pretty consistent stories. Uh, I have, have a friend who was uh, actually on death row Eventually, they overturned his sentence, but he was on death row in Tennessee. And he was a, a biker enforcer. Uh, I wish I could think of the name of the gang, but they were Hell's Angels opponents. And he was, a, he was the enforcer. Well, he, uh, he shot somebody in a, I don't know, some kind of argument. And the uh, guy shot him back. I never have understood that. Don't shoot me back. Don't, you know, just let me shoot you. Don't shoot me back. But uh, he wound up in the hospital, and he killed the guy he shot. He killed, and that's how he got on death row. But he was in the hospital, and he's telling me the story. He said, Don, it's so hard to make anybody believe this. But my mom and dad were in the room, the doctors were working on me, and he said, my body just, my spirit just floated right out of my body. I could look back and see what they were doing. I could tell you what kind of instruments they had. I went right through the ceiling like it wasn't even there. I could see the top of the roof. I could see the air conditioners on the roof of the hospital. And he said, I, I kept going and going. He said, it was like I was on a magic carpet ride. He said, I was just moving. He said, pretty soon I was past the stars. And he said, it was like, it was like you, you know how you see sometimes pictures of the earth and you're just zooming out. And he said, I was, I was out there. And he said, 
he said, then I began to tumble. It wasn't smooth anymore. I was tumbling. And I could smell horrible, horrible odor like sulfur. He said, the more I, I, I realized uh, it was burning flesh. And he said, I, was, I knew I was going to hell. And he said, I cried out, no, 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 no. And he said, I, I came right back on that same trip, right back to the, so I could see the Johnson City overpass in Johnson City, Tennessee. So I saw the air conditioners on the roof. Said, I thought I was going to splat into it like a bug. But he said, right back in my body. And I woke up screaming, no, 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 no. I don't, I don't want to go to hell. But you know what he said? I didn't change. He, uh, well, it's too long a story to tell you the whole details. But he had an out-of-the-body experience. Near-death experience is what they're called. I've heard, I've heard so many stories like that. Something happens. And I believe God gave me some insight to that not long ago. If you're absent from the body, the Bible clearly says you're present with the Lord. You're here, you're there. To be almost absent from the body is to be almost present with the Lord. Almost, I don't, I don't know if, if I can, you know, give you any good examples for that, but I understand it. The spirit was so close to where he was going. He saw something, sensed something. Uh, but we hear it, we hear it in, in Christian circles. You can read stories about them and they're consistent. Well, I saw this bright light and there was such peace and there was a tunnel and there was, there's always a point where if you pass that point, you're not, you're not coming back. But there's a point where you can almost make the decision to come back. I, I don't know what that is. I, I probably shouldn't even try to explain that. But Paul talks about heaven. He talks about the grass being greener in, in uh, get that up, Rich? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, everybody, all of us have experienced what Paul's talking about. Tom said, how are you going to read that? And I said, well, I got, I got big print. But uh, I still can't read it, Tom. <laughs> no, I had, it, I had it wrinkled up too much. Well, we know that if our earthly house, our body, the Bible many times refers to it as our tabernacle. We know if our earthly house, I can't read it. Can you? <laughs> it's too wrinkled up. Yeah, for we know that if our earthly house this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent being burdened not because we want to be unclothed, not because we just want out of the body, but further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We all, we all feel this. We all, uh, you know, feel the groans and the burdens and the aches of life. And, and we all talk about, well, the grass is greener, you know. Yeah, it is. It absolutely is. And uh, that's what Paul said. He said, we, we, we desire to be not just unclothed with this body, to be clothed upon with the house of God. 
The Bible says in the book of Revelation that God will tabernacle in heaven. He will tabernacle with us. Our, his house will be our house. We'll, we'll be with him. Now, I want to I talk, Beth, if, you got, if you're taking notes, about this place called heaven. And it is a place. It's like, I mean, if, if you say, I'm going to Dallas or I'm going to Chicago, uh, you can say, I'm going to heaven. It's a real place. We don't know where it is. But it's a real place. And I'm going to tell you what kind of place it is. These, these, are, these are your notes, Beth. It's a prepared place. And it's prepared by Jesus himself. Now, that was a promise he gave to us when he said, I'm, I'm going to my father's house. I'll be back, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. That's, uh, that's a pretty good word, isn't it? I'm, I've already preached my funeral, by the way. I told some of y'all that. It's already on video. Tommy's got it. Uh, Tommy's got it at his house. Uh, he could change that up. You know, he could just... <laughs> He's, but, but you know what? I'm going to a prepared place. Uh, I'm going to a place that is a real place, and so are you, and it's prepared by Jesus. I mean, it's, it's a done deal. He said, I'm go that's what I'm going to do is to fix you a place. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but... How big would heaven be? How many people do you suppose have lived since Adam? I mean, I, well, I'll be guessing because we, we don't know, but how many do you, would you guess? There's seven billion alive right now. Would it be twice that many? That's what a lot of people say. Probably as many as we have living now, have already lived on this earth. And then, then it's gonna keep increasing. But let's say 15 billion people. What kind, of, uh, what kind of area would it take to have a large percentage of those people? That'd be a pretty good sized place. But we'll be spirits. Paul, I, I, I just, I don't know if this is true. I just heard it. You know, Kevin Sumlin, y'all ever heard of him? He's a coach at, at Texas A&M. And Mac Brown, you ever heard of him? Everybody, yeah, Mac Brown. <laughs> He's the coach at the University of Texas. Now, I heard that they were both killed in a car wreck. And, I mean, it's, it was just a story. but uh, And they arrived in heaven at the same time. And God himself... It's going to show them around heaven. So he takes Kevin Sumlin and he's walking around. They're seeing all these mansions. And they're coming on this, this house that has this painted maroon. Has a big ATM on the side of it. And uh, pretty nice. And Kevin said, that's my house? And he said, yeah. And they keep walking. And in the distance, he could see this huge, like, tower. It had number one on it orange lights coming off of it and orange search lights all around and everything just flashing and uh, he said that uh, that doesn't seem right that Mac Brown would get a house like that he said that's not Mac's house that's my house <laughs> I don't know if that's really true or not but, but it's a prepared place I'm pretty sure God's preparing a special place for me and for you. Not just a place, a prepared place. And you can't really measure it in like houses. Well, how many square feet? It would be like cubic feet, I think. Heaven itself, the new Jerusalem, you can measure it. It's, it's written in the Word. 1,500 miles long. That would be, what, from here to L.A.? 
something like that. And then it's 1,500 miles wide. So then you'd be way up in Canada if you're going that way. And 1,500 miles tall. Now, I actually did some figures. I didn't write them down because I figured nobody wants to know that. But that's a bunch of cubic feet. That's a bunch of cubic feet. And we will be spirits. And so I don't think we'll be confined to, you know, here's your 100,000 cubic foot home. I, I don't, I don't, we, we wonder about things like that, but I don't, I don't think that's the way it's going to be. But it's a, it's not just a place, it's a prepared place. And it's prepared with you in mind. He told the disciples, said, I'm going to prepare you a place. So, you know, there's another story about a guy that petitioned God. Could he, he said, I know you're not supposed to take anything with you. But said, can I just bring one suitcase? And uh, God said, okay, you know. So he gets to heaven, and it's always St. Peter that greets people. I don't know where that came from, but it always is. And uh, Peter says, well, you, you can't bring that suitcase in. He said, oh, God gave me permission. He said, well, I'm going to at least have to inspect it before you bring it in. He opens it up, and it's bars of gold, just bars of gold this guy had amassed. And he said, why would you want to bring pavement up here? <laughs> that's, what, that's what God paves the streets with. The things, the very things that we think are the most, uh, strive the hardest to get. It's, well, that way you use that for pavement. In heaven. It's a prepared place. It's a, it's a palatial place. Palatial. Palace. Things that are there go in a palace. Uh, I don't, I, anybody feel like they live in a palace? No. Uh, I mean, I, if you did, you'd still be who you are. <laughs> but, I mean, it's a palatial place. It's palaces. He called them mansions. And it's just kind of a, just throw that in. Many mansions. I don't know how many people, but it's a populated place. There are people there. It's, it's a prepared place. It's a palatial place. Grass is greener. And it's a populated place. And you know who's, who it's populated with? People. Angels. I mean, can you, can you imagine walking down the street with angels and talking to them and looking up at them or down at them or just visiting with the angels? and uh, People, angels. Do you know what, what, you know what one of the most common things is for near-death experiences when people have this out-of-body experience? You know what they see? Some of them, I mean, a lot of them written. They see their pets who've died. They see their pets from four or five, I don't know, I don't know how many, but it's pretty consistent. Um, I kind of think I'm, I'm going to see my pets in heaven. I'm, I'm pretty sure they just up there walking around waiting. Uh, you know, and like, you know, and I'm saying, look how good I am now. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty good now. But I, I expect to see pets there, and animals, uh, sheep, lions. Uh, I can see them just laying down each other, by each other being buddies. I'm not going to eat you, I promise. Uh, you know, it's a populated place, and it's more than just people. Uh, Tom called me, I don't know, a month ago from, or sent me, maybe sent me a text from Chicago. I said, are you in another one of those gang meetings? Uh, he said, mafia, mafia meeting. <laughs> but it'll be populated, and it'll be populated. You see, this is God's house. This is God's house. 
and we will tabernacle with him. I, you know, I don't think we can imagine, I don't think we can grasp what that might be. It's not only populated, it's perpetual. It, it, goes, on, it goes on. Doesn't stop. There is no end. Uh, you think of things in this life, you think, well, there's got to be an end. Uh, you know, I, I keep talking about that, that church in Connecticut, that guy playing the piano. But just about the time you thought he was at the end, you know, he turned, 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 turned. <laughs> and they're going again, you know. Uh, but it says it's eternal. We can't, we can't grasp that. We just can't grasp that. Uh, I mean, I hit some long drives playing golf. Uh, Look at Paul laughing. Look at him. He just, he's absolutely laughing. <laughs> uh, no, not, I, I used to hit long drives. Now I just hit drives, you know. And, uh, but in heaven, do you think we'll be playing golf? What do you think we'll do? I mean, no end, no time, no limits, no night. Because God himself will be the light. No more sea. Ah, think about that. There's rivers. But no more sea. Now, how's that work? And you, you couldn't comprehend it. I can't comprehend it. There's trees for the health of the nations. Uh, Something way better than what God prepared for Adam and Eve. Uh, you know, when God created Adam and Eve, he created Adam first, and he said, Adam, I, I can see you're kind of lonely, and I'm going to create you a helpmate, somebody to, to be with you. He said, oh, okay, good. Well, he comes back, and he says, uh, I've, I've created her. said, she's over behind that tree if you want to go look. Adam goes and looks, and he comes back. He said, wow, she's beautiful. And God said, I made her that way, so you'd love her. He said, well, can I touch her? He said, yeah, I'll go touch her. He comes back. He said, her skin is so soft, and her hair is like silk. God said, I made her that way, so you'd love her. He said, can I talk to her? He said, yeah, I'll go talk to her. He comes back, he said, that is one stupid woman. <laughs> and God said, I made her that way so she'd love you. <laughs> but, but they were they were put in a they were put in a perfect environment and it was called paradise. And that's where we're going to paradise but the grass is greener in this paradise there won't be any tempter there won't be any sin there won't be any shame think about that there won't be any shame uh, I, don't, I don't know what any, anybody deals with but I know shame is what a lot of people deal with oh man I wish I hadn't done that I wish I hadn't regret those, those things are passed away I mean you just live free Without, without disappointments and expectations. And, um, and by the way, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say on this date, prior to Frank Harbor taking his bar exam, that he will pass his bar exam and he will be an attorney soon. And uh, I hope he's a better attorney than he is a preacher. No, I, Tommy. Mark the footage there. <laughs> no, for, I, I honestly believe this. Frank's one of the best preachers in, in the country. He really is. And, uh, and he actually is a good golfer, too. And he's a very good golfer. So he'll, he'll be a very good attorney. But heaven's a perpetual place. You can't get out. If you don't like it, 
I'm pretty sure that won't happen. But you're there. And I don't know what we'll do. You may have some ideas about that, but I think about it sometimes. I mean, we're just going to sit around and sing and, and praise God. All, just going to sit around and do that? That doesn't sound like that's something I want to do. I mean, being in his presence, I'm pretty sure I would. But I mean, forever? Can, can I have a job, you know? Will you, can I play? Of course. Of course, we'll have assignments. And some people, this, the Bible doesn't say this, but it kind of indicates it. Remember the, uh, the parable Jesus told about uh, he gave talents to these different people? And one of them doubled his talents, and one of them made a little bit, and one of them didn't make anything. Well, their rewards determine their, their uh, status. Uh, so some, I think some of us, we may, we may rule, we may be given our own planet. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm just, this is all speculation. But our, our position in heaven will be determined by our participation on earth. That's, that's very clear, that we'll, we'll stand before uh, the judgment seat of Christ and we'll be rewarded according to our works. So we'll have, we'll have different jobs and things to do. They'll all have to do with helping God reign, you know, being part of his kingdom. Because uh, we're in his house. This is God's house. The grass is greener. It's a perpetual place that just goes on. And it's a personal place. Do you think you'll know anybody when you get to heaven? I mean, do you think the Bible indicates that? That I do. I think it's clear. You ever think about Peter, James, and John when Jesus took them up to the Mount of Transfiguration and there appeared uh, Moses and Elijah? They knew who they were. They'd never, I don't, they'd never seen them before. We're talking about hundreds of years they lived before them, but they knew who they were. And uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, I said this when I preached my funeral. That sounds so strange to say that. But, but you were there, Latrice. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't that big a deal. I'm just, but I, this came from my heart. The proper thing to say is, I want to see Jesus, first of all. That's the, but you know what? I want to see Peggy first. I don't mean that, God knows what I mean. But maybe she'll come with Jesus. Maybe they'll be together. But that's who I want to see first. Do you think she, or anybody, do you think they're aware of what's going on on earth? Do you think we really are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses? Like maybe Moses and Elijah, you think they know what's going on? And millions of others who are saved by them looking for the cross and for the promise and and their faith was imputed to them for righteousness. Do you think, I'm thinking about this, do you think Moses knows me? I'm kind of thinking he does. I don't know if it matters that he does, but I think, they're, I think they're watching, I think they're aware, I think they see prophecy fulfilled and days come in. And, but I'm pretty sure my wife is aware of what's going on. Uh, I kind of think she had something to do with me getting that dog. I think she might have bent God's ear. I don't know. I, I can't give you a scripture that says that. I believe that. And my uh, sister-in-law, Peggy's oldest sister, died about three weeks ago. And she told her daughter... Uh, maybe the day before she died. She said, I've already seen Peggy. 
I've already seen mom and dad. They, they've been in the room. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories like that where they, they're greeting us. And it'll be personal. Heaven's a personal place. You'll be a person. You'll be in a, you, won't, you won't be just one of a bunch of spirits floating around. You'll be, Tom Goodson will be Tom Goodson. Now, I don't, you know, this question always comes up, well, will babies be little babies? Nah, I don't think so. Well, you know, babies that are killed in the womb and they're not even formed, will they be? I don't think so. Well, my great-grandmother looked like she looked when she was dying? I don't think so. But our personalities will be recognizable. The Bible says we, are, we will know as we are known. Isn't that something? That, that people say, oh, that's, that's, there's O'Don, you know. They'll, they'll know our personalities. I don't know what, whether you know, some, some theologians speculate, well, you'll be 33 because that's how old Jesus was. And he was, I, I don't know if there's any, I don't know if we can know that. But we'll have, we'll have perfect bodies. There won't be any chips in my elbow, I know that. I mean, I could, I could beat Paul and Mark any day, <laughs> except, <laughs> no, you know, the, the thing is, it's, the things that we deal with, and the grass is greener. It is greener. It doesn't just look greener, it is greener. And uh, on, the, on the other side, uh, there's a story about a, this preacher talking to a little girl, and it was like outside of church, and she's looking up at the stars, and she said, where is heaven? He said, well, it's on the other side of the stars. said, we're on the bottom side. And she's looking around, she said, if the bottom side looks so beautiful, what must the top side look like? Ah, that's kind of interesting. If, you, if, if you're happy, if you, if you enjoy life, and, and everybody does, everybody enjoys health, everybody enjoys it when people around them, you know, that's the, that's the problem. It's never been me, it's always been the people around me that, <laughs> you know, but when everything's going smooth around you and people love you, and uh, this life's pretty good, it really is, but the grass is greener. And so I, I can see, I can see me like entering into heaven and my mom, my dad. And how, many, how many people do you think are in heaven that you personally knew? I mean, they died and they're gone. Would it be 50, 100? Uh, about relatives, friends? friends? Uh, no, it's a pretty good number. Uh, I anticipate all of those people will welcome you when you come in. Maybe a great grandfather that said, you know, I've been watching. I've been, uh, I, I don't know. But there is a host, of, it's a populated place, it's a personal place. And you won't just be drifting in with, uh, like they do in prison, <laughs> you, you're number 378256 and that's all you'll ever be, is you're just a name in a uniform. I used to tell inmates sometimes, I said, you know, a lot of characteristics in this prison that there are in heaven. I said, you got a wall around you? There's a wall in heaven, 12 gates of pearl, the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, I said, you got a wall around you, you're wearing white uniforms, uh, y'all ought to be happy. And they're like, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, it'll be a personal place and it'll be a peaceful place. Not just a place. It's a prepared place. It's a populated place. It's a palatial place. It's a perpetual place. It's a personal place. And it's a peaceful place. I don't know what peace is, honestly. I mean, I, when Tommy and I were 
putting together some footage for this funeral. That it's probably going to be, all of y'all will probably be dead when this funeral comes, but you are invited. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't know when it's, <laughs> I don't know when it's going to happen. But you know what, you know what I, <laughs> you know what I had difficulty finding? I was putting a picture up there for peace. And you know what kind of pictures come up if you're looking on the internet and you're searching for an image of peace? I don't know if I'd call it peace or not. It'd be a green pasture and nothing in it, just a tree out there. I'm thinking, I'd be miserable out there. <laughs> Chiggers and, that's not peaceful. Or you see, you know, all of, the, all of our descriptions are images of peace. They're not really what I call peace. Or you see somebody sitting in a chair rocking and nothing going on around them. I don't know if that's peace or not. I really don't know how you describe peace except it's the absence of problems. And there will be no problems. It'll be a place of peace. It is a place of peace. And Paul said, I, I would like to be out of this body, but I'm not complaining. I'm satisfied with this body. But it'd be better to be unclothed with this tabernacle and to be in his tabernacle. But he said, I'll just, I'll just go there when he calls. I'm okay. But he said, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And it's not even like here today, there tomorrow. It's here today, there today. And, uh, you know, so the grass is greener. It, it's okay to look at that grass and say that. I'm going to get that grass someday. I'm, I'm sticking my head through the fence now, and I'm, I'm peeping in, and I, I get little glimpses, and, and I feel touches from, from God's Spirit. But someday... I'm knocking the fence down. I'm, I'm coming through that fence, you know. Uh, anyway, it's, it's a perfect place. Anything you could try to add, you, it's already been done. You know, uh, Gil, do you ever help design the house, decide what's going to be in the house? And if you build a house, you, 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 ever, you ever build a house and look back and say, oh, we, we, we should have put this in there. Do you know what? You won't be able to add anything. You, you'll be thinking, how, how can he just come up with everything being perfect? It's God's house. That's where we're going is to God's house. And I don't know. I don't know how many motels I've stayed in over the years. Thousands. Thousands. And... Um, so, I mean, some of them said, this is a five-star hotel. You know what? It's just a bed in a room. That's all it is. <laughs> you get up in the morning and you spend the night in a five-star hotel. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's all it is. No matter how it's decorated and pillows fluffed up, and uh, that's all it is. Uh, there's a, there's a guy I know, and I, I'm, I'm going to close with this, but there's a guy I know that is very, very wealthy. I don't know how much money he's got. He probably doesn't know. But he's probably got $10,000 in every bank in Texas. He's a wealthy man. And uh, he's, a, he, he's, a, he's a friend. Uh, but you know what he asked me one day? Think about this. Is this all there is? I've been to his ranch. Peggy and I have been to his ranch down on the river that you know, laid out pecan trees and fishing. And, and he's got anything he wants. But he asked me that question one day. Is this all there is? No, it's all there is here. But the grass is greener. It is greener. And uh, so don't get too caught up in 
your problems. And if, you, if you want to trade problems with somebody someday, call me and I'll try to arrange it where uh, y'all can meet. And you probably wouldn't. You probably, you'd probably say, I'll just keep my own. Uh, but the grass is greener in heaven. And I, I don't know how many times I've preached, uh, thousands of times, since I was 19 years old. 20 years ago. <laughs> no, but I, I've, preached a, I've, I've preached a lot of places, a lot of messages. You know what the bottom line of every message is? Don't you want to go to heaven? Do you know, uh, you ever heard of uh, a preacher named uh, Dr. James Kennedy, Coral Gables, Florida? This is supposedly a true story, and I think it is. He was called to a conference with a bunch of other preachers when Ronald Reagan was president. And um, in the conference, in a quiet time, a time away from business, he said, uh, President Reagan, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Um, if you were standing at heaven's gates, and God asked you, why should I let you in? What would you tell him? He said, the president paused for a minute. And he said, probably God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And I've done that. Isn't that something? It's all you can do. All you're supposed to do. But what a reward. What would you tell God? Hey, I know your son. I, you know what pleases God? Talk about his son. Talk about his son. And, uh, well, I, I do want to, I, I, I am going to say one more thing that's talking about the son. I know the Rangers are already behind three to nothing. Runners on second and third. <laughs> no. No. Uh, but, you know, when uh, my sons were in high school, I went to all the games, junior high. Sean, you going to Virginia next month? Oh, you just got back? Well, I'm going to be there next month uh, at church in Virginia. But anyway, when they, were, when they were playing sports, and I was so proud. I mean, I'm, I'm the dad, you know. But I remember I was sitting in the stands one day, and. My son, who's, who's now a doctor, he's coming down the court. He's dribbling the ball. He's left-handed. He still is. You know, he, he, he was dribbling down the court, you know, and he'd go behind his back and between his legs, and guys are scrambling all over the floor trying to get it. And people said, man, look at that number 15. I said, that's my son, right over here. <laughs> that's my son. Do you know what I believe? And when you talk about Jesus, God saying, that's my son. And you already got his attention when you're talking about Jesus. That's my son. Do you know where I'm going? I'm going to God's house. <laughs> Think about that. Well, you going to McDonald's first? Probably. <laughs> you know, you, you going home to see your dog first? Probably. But I'm going to God's house. That's where I'm headed. The grass is greener. And I pray everybody in here, so you got that settled in your heart. I'm going to God's house. And if you, if you can keep that focused in your mind, things in this world, that they just, they're, they're not very important. I'm going to God's house. Let me ask you to, to bow your head, close your eyes. And I just want to ask you the question I always ask. Is anybody, would there be anybody here? that would say, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to God's house, but I want to be sure. And you just want me to pray for you, but you just slip your hand up and then put it right back down. Anybody? That means by your testimony, we're all going to God's house. Thank God for that. I was lost, but you knew where to find me I was hungry you were bread for my soul 
I was thirsty. And you gave living water. You were my shelter when I had no place to go. That's why sometimes I just want to praise you. Sometimes just to speak your name. Sometimes I just want to thank you without asking you for a thing. Oh, sometimes I lift my hands to you. Then sometimes all I do is cry. Everything that I have, I owe to you. Lord in Calvary, the reason why. When I think of the love and Lord I think of the price that you paid for me well these old trials down here on earth <laughs> they just don't seem like nothing when compared to dark Yeah, sometimes I just want to praise you. Can you praise him today? Sometimes just to speak your name. Sometimes I just want to thank you. Without asking you for a thing, oh, sometimes I lift my hands to you, then sometimes all I do is cry. Everything that I have, I owe to you. Lord in Calvary, the reason why. Sing it with me one more time. Yes, sometimes I just want to praise you. Sometimes just to speak your name. Speak your name. Sometimes I just want to thank you. Without asking you for a thing. You ever done that?
Lord and Calvary, the reason why. You know, God delivered me in 1985, June 16th, 1985, 8.30 p.m. from alcohol and drugs. Now, all these programs are, are great things. I don't take this wrong. But I'm telling you what, I knelt down and went to the Master, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the great physician, and he delivered me that day. So I am so grateful, and I've never... Never touched it, can't stand to smell it now. It makes me sick. Praise God for that. Amen. Amen.